Well, hello. I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking to you today about the uh, spin analytical membrane confined electrophoresis apparatus. And what we're going to talk about is, uh, first of all, charge measurement, how you make charge measurement, best practices for charge measurement. And then uh, Kiara is going to go through and show you how the instrument is set up to run and, and running it. And I'll go over the analysis software and what you get from the analysis software. And after that, uh, we can have questions and answers. We'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. So charge is a very important parameter to, to know about. I uh, gave a talk down there recently. I will not go into any great detail, but I'll show you in a minute why you need to know about charge. If you look over in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see two vials. One has a monoclonal antibody whose charge is about 5, and 50 millimolar sodium chloride, it crashes out of solution. Uh, the second antibody has a charge of about 10, and under those same solvent conditions, it is uh, uh, remains perfectly clear. So some questions we have to uh, address are, uh, what is the charge in the protein? When I tell you that the charge is, is uh, plus 5, what do I mean? When I tell you it's plus 10, what does it mean? How we measure the charge using electrophoresis, and what are the good practices for it, and then charge measurement by the MCE. So charge is important because it is what keeps your protein in solution. If you look at these two graphs, the upper graph shows the uh, activation energy profile for a protein has a charge of about 10. And the one down below that shows you the activation profile for something that has a charge of about 3 or 4. The aggregation rate, uh, shown over to the right, uh, for the low charge molecule is at least a thousand fold higher than the aggregation rate for the one that has a charge of about 20. And only charge contributes to a positive value of the activation energy. All the other proximity energies, weak interactions between the molecules will be attractive and therefore cause the, the protein to come out of solution. Now, there's, uh, the colloidal scientists have been working with charge on, on polymers for a long, long time, and they've come up with a, a set of a rule of thumb about the charge, and the rule of thumb is shown here in the table. If you have a charge, the bihuckle henry charge, that's the second column, ZDHH, and the charge is less than 10, you're begging for trouble. You're going to have rapid coagulation or flocculation uh, or incipient instability. If you have a charge of between 9 and 12, you have moderately stable uh, system. And if you have a charge greater than 12, you have good stability. Again, a rule of thumb that, that uh, this is just from experience. If you have a charge on a monoclonal antibody of 15 or more, that monoclonal antibody will not exhibit trouble with viscosity, nor will it have solubility problems. The uh, intermediate uh, charge values between 9 and 12 can still have viscosity problems. Viscosity is a dipole moment uh, problem, and uh, you need to have a high enough charge that the dipole moment doesn't get in the way of the uh, uh, sol solubility of your molecule. So even a, a molecule that has a charge of 10 or 11 can still exhibit some viscosity uh, problems at high concentrations. You really want to have a charge of around 12 to 15. So what is the protein charge? What are, what are the units? How is it described? There's, it's an old literature, so there's a lot of different descriptions for it. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, and what gives rise to the charge. But first of all, it is really important to understand that the charge is not just the von der Waals structure. At the current time, there is no computer program that can calculate the charge accurately on a protein molecule, even from a crystallographic structure. And the fundamental problem is that the programs that exist right now assume that only protons bind them to proteins, and that's simply not true. It's not a hard shell uh, potential. In fact, it extends out into space. It extends out into space about a nanometer or so from the surface of the protein. So it, it's not, uh, again, a crystallographic structure it shows you the electron orbitals. But here we're talking now about the charge-charge interactions, and those extend away from the surface of the molecule. There are lots of terms that are used for charge measurement. Uh, you'll see zeta potential, electrophoretic mobility, 
an effective charge. And I'll talk just a, briefly about what these different measurements are. The electrophoretic mobility, the first one, is the velocity of the particle in the electric field. So it's the velocity divided by the electric field. It is the analog of the sedimentation coefficient, which is the velocity divided by the gravitational field. And this is typically the value that is measured in an electrophoresis experiment. From this quantity, the electrophoretic mobility, there are a number of other descriptions of the charge that are derived. The first one is the zeta potential. That's number two. And that's simply the electrophoretic mobility, which is now adjusted for the viscosity of the solvent. That's three times eta in the numerator. The dielectric constant, which uh, is down below in, uh, in the denominator, and Henry's function, that capital H. And Henry's function takes into account uh, two effects, the electrophoretic effect, that is the fact that the molecule is, is distorting the electric field and ions are having to flow around it. There's momentum transfer with that process. And the second one is, is, uh, has to do with the uh, disproportionation of ions across the surface of the, of the molecule. But Henry calculated this back in 1931. There are actually three Henry's functions, depending upon the size of the uh, ion that you're looking at. The second uh, descriptor, number three on the, on the list there, is the effective charge. This is simply the electrophoretic mobility multiplied by the frictional coefficient. It is the same frictional coefficient that uh, appears in diffusion, and in sedimentation, so it's 6 pi times the viscosity times the Stokes radius of the molecule. And this is an effective charge that uh, accounts not for the protein charge alone, but the protein charge plus the counter ion cloud that's around the, the protein. In order to take into account the counter ion cloud, we look at the Debye Huckel Henry cloud. That's the effective, uh, the Debye Huckel Henry charge, number four. This is the effective charge uh, multiplied by 1 plus kappa A, that is the Debye term, divided by Henry's function. The difference between the two of them is that the effective charge is very dependent on the solvent conditions, in particular the salt concentration. As you increase the salt concentration, the effective charge is decreased. The Debye Huckel Henry charge, though, is independent of the solvent. And so if you measure the charge on a, on a protein, say, at, at a uh, 100 millimolar salt, and then compare that charge to a value measured in lower salt concentration, the Debye Huckel Henry charge will change very little because it really is looking at the charge on the molecule, taking into account the solvent effects. Now we're going to focus not on the uh, zeta potential, but rather we're going to look at the Debye Huckel Henry charge. And the reason for that is that the Biochel Henry charge is a, a more valid descriptor for protein molecules. Zeta potential is what's used for very large particles, uh, objects that are in the order of microns in size. And it, you use the zeta potential if the value of kappa times A is greater than 6. The effective charge and the Biochel Henry charge are used if the uh, product kappa times A is less than 6. And for something like a monoclonal antibody, the value of kappa times A is around 2. So we, we tend to want to use the Debye Huckel Henry charge as our descriptor. Now the charge on a protein, as I mentioned, is not simply the, the charge you'd calculate, say, from an isoelectric point determination and the pH. There are several things that can influence the charge on a protein. The first one is the shift in pKa. If you look at a protein, in this case it's uh, ribonuclease SA, the calculated charge on it is minus 7.3. The Debye Huckel Henry charge that's measured is minus 5.1. And the calculation in this case is what you would calculate based on the isoelectric point and the pH. There are two mutants that are shown here. One is one in which uh, uh, two aspartic acids have been converted to a lysine. One is where uh, spartic and glutamic acids, five of them, have been converted to lysines. And you can see that the calculated charge becomes more positive as you uh, make those changes. The measured value becomes more positive, but doesn't really match the calculated value very well. Now, Nick Pace, who produces this, this protein uh, in large quantities, has sent it over to Spain, and they've measured the pKa's of all the titrable groups 
on these uh, both the wild type and the two mutant forms. And when you use the measured pKa's, you'll see that the value of the charge that we determine in, by electrophoresis is a much better match for the value that uh, is calculated based on the pKa's. So the, what's going on in this in this uh, case, they have crystallographic structures for each of these uh, proteins, is that uh, you have ion pair formation and you have buried, uh, the solvent accessibility is low for some of the titrable groups. And when you take those into account now, you see that the charge that you measure is more akin to the charge that uh, you would expect. Now the second thing that influences uh, charge on protein is what's called territorial binding. The territorial binding is where an ion is confined to a region along the surface of the protein, but not bound to a particular site. So we're very used to site binding, where you have, say, a calcium ion binding to an EF hand on a protein. It binds to that particular location. It shows up in crystallographic analysis. But there's a whole class of ion binding that has more to do with the surface potential, say you bring uh, two or three lysine residues to within a few angstroms of one another, you now have a region that has a very high positive charge. And nature is not going to let that stand. The, uh, the electrostatic potential in that region is high. And so a chloride ion will come in and will hang around in that region. It doesn't bind to any site. It will not be visible in crystallography because it's not. it doesn't stay still. And it won't be uh, visible in NMR as well. And shown on the right-hand side is a, a double-stranded DNA, that kind of purple, wiggly, spaghetti-like uh, track that's on there, comes from a sodium ion. It's a model of a sodium ion. I think we're losing you in between. Pardon? It's something on the order. This is a, a one nanosecond simulation of a sodium <laughs> ion in the vicinity of uh, uh, the, the DNA. And for... Uh, proteins, this also occurs. So look at the 7A. Factor 7A is a blood clotting factor. The calculated charge is near minus 20. And the charge uh, that we actually measure is closer to minus 7. This has to do with the fact that the factor 7A has uh, gamma carboxyglutamic acids. There's a uh, region on the protein where there are 10 of these gamma carboxyglutamic acids in a very short stretch of amino acids. And that region would be expected to bind cations sodium in, in a sodium chloride buffer, protons would probably be in there as well. So this is a second reason that the charge that you measure may not be the same as what you calculate. And finally, there is weak anion uh, binding. This is something that uh, uh, our predecessors in, in protein chemistry knew about. So People like Scatcher and Tanford were very interested in this uh, problem of ion binding by proteins, monovalent anion binding. And you can see these are data from uh, Yatin Gokarn's uh, uh, group out at, in uh, Genentech. And you can see that anions bind to a protein. In this case, there's a constant concentration of the salt and we're measuring the charge on a protein. And the charge changes dramatically as you go from fluoride over to sulfate. And in fact, they fall right on the Hofmeister series, the, the amount of charge neutralization that occurs with the anion. You don't see as a great a, an effect of uh, cations as you do with anions. And there's a, a whole lecture into why that works. But here's the bottom line. Here are two monoclonal antibodies, some work that was done by John Champagne in my laboratory a few years ago. These are two different monoclonal antibodies. The charge that's calculated at pH 6 for monoclonal antibody 1 is 22, and for monoclonal antibody 2 is 28. When you actually measure the charge, uh, the charge on monoclonal antibody 1 is plus 5.4, and for monoclonal antibody 2, it's around plus 9. As you go from no added salt to 100 millimolar salt, this is now the Debye Huckle Henry charge. You can see the charge changes slightly, but it doesn't change a great deal. Uh, in the case of monoclonal antibody one, it goes down a little bit. In the case of monoclonal antibody two, it goes up a little bit. The reason for this has mostly to do with anion binding. Shown on this graph, a set of standard proteins, those are the blue squares. 
Uh, the standard proteins are ones where the charge has been measured by another method, uh, titration typically. And you can see the data fall on a straight line. These are the uh, values of the charge on these proteins uh, measured a couple of different ways uh, versus the Dubai-Huckle-Henry charge, the one that we measure in our instrument. And they fall on a, a line that has a slope of 1. It has an intercept that is near 0. It's not quite 0. Up above that are shown 26 monoclonal antibodies, different monoclonal antibodies at pH 6. And those data should fall on that same line as the blue squares, and clearly it does not. It's offset. It's offset by about 20. If you go from pH 6 to pH 5, you'd expect the charge to become even more positive for these antibodies. But in fact, it doesn't charge up nearly. They, none of them charge up as much as you would expect. And now your calculation of the charge is off by 50. So these are not subtle effects. These are big effects and ones that need to be measured. And if we now overlay on top of these the regions where you have colloidal instability, uh, incipient stability, and good stability, you can see that the uh, uh, only a few of these antibodies actually would fall into a range where you could be certain that the, the protein would be stable colloidally. And in fact, uh, where it's been investigated, uh, the antibodies to the left have poor solubility characteristics and or poor viscosity uh, characteristics.